to the echo chamber. Up until this point, I've maintained that because the internet shows us how much there is to know, and how deeply we disagree about everything, our old strategy of knowing, by reducing what there is to be known, knowledge that is shaped like the data information knowledge wisdom pyramid, is badly adapted to the new ecology. Instead, we are adopting strategies that take advantage of our new medium's near infinite capacity. As a result, our basic idea of what knowledge looks like and how it works has been changing. Yet three of the four tactics for dealing with diversity we just looked at recommend reductive tactics. Get just enough diversity, use a moderator to keep diversity from getting too great, and fork discussions when they become too diverse. What's going on? Has the accessibility of this superabundance of ideas and knowledge changed nothing? In fact, has the superabundance of knowledge made us more narrow-minded? Fork birthers or enthusiastic supporters of President Obama into their own discussion, and they're likely to close themselves to external criticism and egg one another on, rather than be opened up by a good, diverse conversation. This happens not just in goal-directed policy discussions. Everywhere on the net, people are forking themselves into groups of like-minded people because it is fun to engage with people who share our enthusiasms, but also because we can't get our shared work done if we constantly have to argue about first principles. Groups that fork themselves so tightly that they include only people who agree with them are called echo chambers. If people are living in echo chambers on the internet, then it doesn't matter how many different differences, disagreements, and points of view are present outside each chamber. If we're holding ourselves up with people who think exactly the way we do, then knowledge is hiding from diversity, excluding more differences than ever before. If the net is creating more echo chambers, the biggest loser will be democracy, for the citizenry will be polarized and thus less able to come to agreement and to compromise when it cannot. This is perhaps the greatest concern expressed by Cass Sunstein, Sunstein, a constitutional scholar and currently the administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regula Regula Regulatory Affairs. Sunstein, who is the most cited living legal scholar in the United States, has written a couple of books on the topic. In Republic.com, published in 2001, he argues that when people get to choose what they see, they will tend toward that which is familiar, comfortable, and, re and reinforcing of their existing beliefs, a tendency others call homophily. Sunstein shows the distressing power of homophily by pointing out that, quote, if you take the 10 most highly rated television programs for whites, and then take the 10 most highly rated programs for African Americans, you will find little overlap between them. Indeed, seven of the 10 programs most highly rated by African Americans rank as the very least popular program for whites." End quote. Quote, similar divisions can be found on the internet, he adds. End quote. He lists sites that are explicitly designed for African Americans, for young women, for young men, and so on. He also cites research that he and a colleague did that found that of 60 randomly chosen political sites, only 15% put in links to sites of their opponents. Quote, many people are mostly hearing more and louder echoes of their own voices, end quote, because the internet so increases the range of choices that citizens can find narrowly focused groups that precisely precisely mirror that point of view. The news is even worse than that, Sunstein fears. Study, studies have shown that when people speak only with those with whom they agree, they not only become more convinced of their own views, they tend to adopt more extreme versions of those views. This group polarization happens for two reasons, Sunstein says. First, the members of the group have a smaller pool of views from which to drink. Second, 
because people want to be perceived favorably by other group members, they will often adjust their views toward the dominant position. Quote, in countless studies, exactly this pattern is observed. End quote. Uh, the picture Sunstein paints is scary for those who care about democracy and disappointing to those who had hoped for the, that the internet would move us toward the traditional ideal of a knowledgeable person, open-minded, fact-oriented, and eager to explore other perspectives. Sunstein's studies of group polarization specifically looked at offline interactions. So, we need to know, is the net in fact closing our minds and moving us toward more extreme views? Sunstein is convinced, quote, group polarization is unquestion unquestionably occurring on the internet, end quote. His evidence is that, quote, it seems plain that the internet is serving, for many, as a breeding ground for extremism, end quote, pointing to cyber cascades in which a belief rapidly gains many believers because it is being passed around the net as true. Plus, quote, a number of studies have shown group polarization in internet-like settings, end quote. But how big a problem is it on the net? As Sunstein acknowledges in an, in an edition of Republic.com published a year later, quote, to know whether this is a serious problem, we need much more information, end quote. Does it happen a lot, a little, all the time? Compared to what? How often? How much? Does the Internet's diversity of sources ever depolarize some groups? If so, why those and not others? Um, perhaps as Clay Shirky has suggested, Sunstein has it exactly backwards. Perhaps political discourse is coarsening, not because people are walling themselves into echo chambers, but, quote, precisely because people are constantly exposed to other points of view, end quote. Indeed, some recent, some recent evidence suggests the polarization may not be as extreme as Sunstein thinks. Economists Matthew Genskow and Jesse Shapiro published a paper in 2010 that looked not at which sites linked to which, but what sites individual users actually visit as they spend time on the net. This study's results seem to be the opposite of one Sunstein's group polarization idea would lead us to expect. Quote, visitors of extreme conservative sites such as RushLimbo.com and GlennBeck.com are more likely than a typical online news reader to have visited NYTimes.com. Visitors of extreme liberal sites such as ThinkProgress.org and MoveOn.org are more likely than a typical online news reader to have visited FoxNews.com. End quote. That is, those visiting the most obvious examples of partisan echo chambers are also more likely than most people to visit sites on the other side of the political divide. So, is the net reducing our shared experience, leading to group polarization, and thus hurting democracy by making us narrower, narrow, narrower knowers than ever? The Genskow Shapiro study suggests not but it's just one study, and it is subject to dispute. For example, Ethan Zuckerman, my colleague at the Berkman Center, took a careful look at it and drew exactly the opposite conclusions. He points out that the study finds that net users are more insular than users of just about all the old media. Indeed, if we were simply to look around the net using our own experience as a guide, the opposite of a careful methodology, granted, many of us would, like Ken, 
Cass Sunstein conclude that people do seem to be more polarized and more uncivil than ever. If you want to attract attention on the internet, talking in extremes seems to be an effective tactic. We are not yet close to having a solid answer to Sunstein's question. Yet, it's worth noting that it always seems to be those other folks who are being made stupid by the net. Most of us feel, as we're Googling around, that the net is making us smarter, better informed, with more answers at our literal fingertips, better able to explore a topic, better able to find the points of view that explain and contextualize that which we don't yet understand. Not Nicholas Carr. He thinks the net is making all of us stupider including himself, but more or less for the opposite reason that Sunstein worries about. Carr notes at the beginning of his wonderfully, wonderfully titled book, The Shallows, that he realized in 2007 that his own cognitive processes were changing because of the net, and not for the better. Quote, I missed my old brain, end quote, he writes. For Carr, the cause is not the presence of echo chambers, but their rough opposite. The linking, blinking, twittering diversity of the net is making us dumb. The web is reshaping our physical brains, Carr contends, quote, weakening our capacities for the kind of deep processing that underpins mindful knowledge acquisition, inductive analysis, critical thinking, imagination, and reflection, end quote. He cites studies of the brain and of behavior to prove that the internet is getting us not only to think differently, but to think worse. Carr's picture accords with what many of us have sensed. These days, we seem to be more easily distracted. We have less patience for long books. We want to jump over the boring parts to get to the meat. We have difficulty remembering how we got to where we are on the web. At the same time, the studies Carr cites do not accord with the sense many of us have that we are now smarter than we were because the only limit on how quickly we can get answers is our typing speed, and because our curiosity has to travel only the length of a finger flick to be satisfied, and then be aroused again. We all know that some of the places where we are, where we are smartest work only because they have properties of echo chambers. The clamor of disagreeing voices is muffled or silenced. Knowledge has always needed communities to flourish. Communities need walls so that they can let in the right amount of diversity, even if too frequently they err on the side of homogen homogeneity. Homogeneity? But now the net has made community walls semi-impermeable. The transparency of the net lets outsiders look in and insiders look out. And you may be exchanging ideas in a community that Cass Sustine would call an echo chamber, but you got there by passing uh, by passing through the daily chaotic royal of ideas on the net. Our old echo chambers were like quiet libraries in quiet communities. Our new echo chambers, knowledgeable knowledge communities, are on the busiest street in the world and there are no windows thick enough to cut out all the noise. So, is the net making us stupider or smarter? The net is new, the research is relatively scant, and the net, and the net is rapidly evolving. The answers may well, in fact probably do, vary by the usual variables in such studies, economic level, education, gender, politics, interests, geography, culture, and so on, the concept of echo chambers is itself slippery. And then there is the difficulty of measuring any quality as culturally determined as smartness. As Carr writes, quote, the net is making us smarter only if we define intelligence by the net's own standards, end quote. The answer to the question Quote, is the net making us smarter or stupider, end quote, is going to be settled not by thinking through the problem, but by living through it. 
Yet there is a sense in which it does not matter. Whether or not the web tends to make us more insular, we know that human beings have a tendency towards homophily. We prefer to be with people who are like us. All the participants in this debate agree that excessive homophily is a bad thing. All the participants agree that we should be bending our efforts to work against our homophilitic tendencies. And no participants, not Cass Sunstein, not Nicholas Carr, are suggesting that we roll the net back up and throw it away as a bad idea. So, why so many years of debate and with such passion? Because something else is at stake. Uh, I guess I'll read this last paragraph. Unsettled Discourses. Al Gore published The Assault on Reason in 2007, in the middle of George Bush's second term, so it's understandable that he felt some despair. Quote, Why do reason, logic, and truth seem to play a sharply diminished role in the way America now makes important decisions? End quote. He asks on the first page. After many chapters convincingly making the case that governance has become unmoored from fact and argument, Gore talks about the internet as a quote, source of great hope for the future vitality of democracy. End quote. Unmoored, what's that mean? Unmoored. 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 That's good enough. Uh, not or no longer attached to a mooring. Okay. Of a person. Insecure, confused, or lacking contact with reality. Mooring. Mooring is a place where a boat or ship is moored. <laughs> Moor. Okay, the root of it, moor, is make fast a boat by attaching it by cable or rope to the shore or to an anchor. Uh, yeah, the one other thing I wanted to say is that uh, in that in that book, um, it's funny to think that uh, four years ago uh, we were concerned about birthers, the people denying Obama's um, citizenship as uh, the biggest example of uh, widespread extremism on the internet. And um, now we just had an insurrection at the Capitol. So we've progressed a little bit. And I guess that's why I chose to read this, this part of the book. Uh, it seems to uh, ring quite true and very much prescient uh, these days.